today we will be talking about the five principles of creating clarity, how to create clarity in your writing using Pro Writing Aid. Um, and for those of who, you whom I, I have not met before, my name is Haley. I am the head of education at Pro Writing Aid. Been here for about four years. Um, I am a former English teacher, and I do all of our content on um, our blog content as well as our webinar content. I really focus to make sure that everybody knows how to use the tool, um, both how to use the tool in itself, and then also how to use it specifically to improve different types of writing. So today we are going to do three things. First, we're going to review why clarity is the most important goal for all writers. Then we're going to talk about five key principles that will make your writing more clear. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about how to apply those principles using Pro Writing Aid to your writing to make it more effective. So I will be showing you how to use the tool to make your writing more effective. And then I'll also at the end, as I mentioned, leave some space for questions as well as some space to answer any questions about Pro Writing Aid that I haven't gone through already. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive in. So clarity is an essential part of storytelling. If your writing isn't clear, your work is not going to engage readers. As writers, no matter what we're writing, whether that's a blog post, an email, um, a fiction story, a nonfiction story, a memoir, a paper for school, whatever we're writing, our job is to get our meaning across clearly and effectively. If our writing is too complicated or too hard to follow, that means that we're not doing our job. When we're not doing our job, it means our writing is unclear, which means that our readers, again, no matter who they are, whether they are fellow bloggers, whether they are people at work, whether they are fiction readers, whoever they are, those readers are going to spend more time trying to figure out what we're saying than actually engaging with our ideas. Good writing, again, no matter what your genre, is always going to prioritize clearly communicating ideas over showing off fancy, confusing language. A lot of times people always say, you know, I need to show off <laughs> my language and my writing. They feel like they need to come up with complicated sentence constructions um, or use a, a fancy vocabulary to make sure that their writing uh, conveys their how smart they are and conveys their, their seriousness about a topic. However, good writing is actually about the ideas. And if your writing can be clear enough to convey those ideas, it's going to do a much better job of highlighting those ideas than if you're hiding them behind complicated sentence structures. So before we get too far, let's talk specifically about what I mean when I say clarity. So when I'm talking about clarity, I'm talking about three things. The first is how easy your writing is to understand. At its baseline, that is what clarity means. Can someone understand what you're saying? The next two things are related to that first definition. So how easy your writing is to understand relates to who your readers are. Every single one of us on this webinar has a different set of readers. That means we're going to set up our sentences in different ways because we are writing for different readers. Different readers have different sets of understanding. So if you're writing an academic paper, your readers are going to have a different set of understanding than if you're writing a romance novel and vice versa, right? Every set of readers has their own scale of what's easy for them to understand and what's not easy for them to understand. So it's really important to think about who your readers specifically are and what their baseline of understanding is when, um, when understanding whether or not your writing is clear or not. It is not just one baseline. It is not just one thing for everyone. Clarity is going to be different depending on what you're writing and who you're writing for. So you always need to come back to your readers when deciding whether or not your work is clear. Um, and then finally, clarity is also making sure that you have a rich and specific language that adds to your reading reader's understanding. A lot of times people get really nervous when I talk about clarity. They also get really nervous using a tool like Pro Writing Aid and they worry that using a tool like that is going to make their writing sound just like everyone else's. They also worry that it's going to take all the personality out of their writing. Could not be further from the case. Good writing does have rich and specific language. It has to, however, add to your reader's understanding. You don't want to just throw in fancy words or fancy terms or complicated structures just for the heck of it. You want to make sure that those are there for a reason. If they are there for a reason, it's important to have them. But if you're not focused on that and you're just kind of putting them in there, um, either to unnecessarily complicate your writing or just because you're not aware of some stylistic concerns, then it's better to remove those. So we need to consider who our readers are and what they can understand when deciding what our reader, uh, how to set up our sentences. 
Um, and then on the other hand, clarity has nothing to do with how simple or juvenile the ideas in your writing are. You can have very complicated ideas and still make your writing really clear and really simple and to the point, right? So clarity of sentence structure and simplicity of sentence structure does not equate to simplicity of ideas. You can have very complicated, very adult ideas while still having simple, clear sentence structures. I'd actually argue that it's even more important potentially to have simple, clear sentence structures when you're talking about potentially complex ideas because you want to make sure people understand what you're actually trying to get across. Clarity also has nothing to do with whether or not your prose is engaging, unique, or exciting. You can definitely have great, engaging, unique prose while still being clear. And we'll talk all about how to do that in just a second. So how do we get to clarity? Clarity starts at the sentence level. Sentences are like mini movies. Every sentence is a complete story in itself. Um, if I were to say, you know, Haley delivers a webinar, you can all close your eyes and picture what that looks like. If I were to say Haley climbs mountain, you could picture what that looks like. Those are all kind of complete stories in themselves, right? Every single sentence needs to be clear in order for your whole story to be clear. When you have clear sentences, you have clear paragraphs. When you have clear paragraph, you will have a clear piece of writing. Again, whether that's an email, whether that's a novel, whatever you're writing, you need to be focused sentence by sentence to make sure the whole is clear. If you're focusing just too high level, you're never gonna get in far enough to make sure that every single sentence is clear. So that being said, how do we write clear sentences? So there are five key principles that I like to focus on when I think about making work clear. The first is to make your subjects your stars. The second is to reduce glue words. The third is to use powerful verbs. The fourth is to target the correct readability. And the fifth is to choose specific words. If you didn't get those all down, don't worry, we're gonna go into them one by one and then I'm gonna talk about how to use Pro Writing Aid to fix each. So let's start with principle one, make your subjects your stars. So subjects are the main actors in your text. It is important to prioritize them. You should treat them like the stars of the sentence that they are. When you've written a sentence with passive voice, that means you've put the object of your sentence before the subject. Remember, the subject is the star, so it should be prioritized. Passive voice, because it puts the subject at the end of the sentence or after the object, that's going to take away the power from your sentence, from your subject. So let's look at this. A uh, very simple example of passive voice. The present was opened by Jane. In this sentence, Jane is the one doing something. She is the object, but she is coming at the very, very end of the sentence. It's almost presented like this image here, right? The present comes first. It's the first thing you, that pops into your mind when you're thinking about the sentence. If we were to slow this sentence, uh, if we were to go back to the concept that a sentence is like a mini movie and play this movie very, very, very slowly, the first thing you would see is a present then you would see that present being opened and only at the very end of that movie would you see who was even doing the opening. You would see that it was Jane, right? In a sentence like that, it's very unclear who is doing the opening until the end. Now, this is a super simple sentence, so it's not going to get uh, in the way of anyone's understanding too much, but the more complex your sentences are, the more passive voice can hide the subject and take power away from someone. Now, passive voice is often too wordy and confusing, particularly for complex ideas. It can negatively affect readers, particularly if it matters who the subject is and you're trying to present information in the most clear cut and straightforward way. That being said, passive voice is not grammatically incorrect. Many of us will use passive voice all the time because it's grammatically correct. It's okay to use. It is okay to use passive voice since it's not grammatically correct, since it's uh, gr grammatically incorrect, excuse me, <laughs> since it's grammatically correct. It's just important to make sure you choose one. So this concept is something I want you to focus on throughout this webinar. You can choose to use all of the principles I'm talking about. However, for many writers, these principles are bad habits. They're things that just happen and fall into their writing. And what we should be doing is striving to make that not the case striving to make sure we're choosing to use these uh, particular stylistic choices rather than just having them happen to us. Passive voice just happens to me all the time because I'm not thinking about it, which is why I use pre-writing aid. I'll get to that in a second. But again, the goal here is not to just completely eliminate all passive voice because it's wrong, because it's not wrong. The goal is to make sure you are choosing to use it when it's effective. 
So here are three times you might choose to use passive voice. First, if the subject of your sentence is unknown. So say you're writing an academic paper and in the paper you're referencing Stonehenge. And you wanna say that about 5, 000, Stonehenge was built around 5,000 years ago. We don't know who built it. We don't know the subject. It doesn't matter in this instance. We do not have to focus on the subject in the sentence because we don't know them, right? It's okay in this instance to use it. Um, it's also okay to use passive voice if the subject is irrelevant. So for instance, the time in life building was constructed in 1959 doesn't really matter who constructed it because that's not the point of the sentence, so we don't need to use it. You can also use passive voice if you want to make a deliberate choice to affect your reader in a specific way. So for instance, in a fiction sentence like Mary realized a suspicious package had been left on her door, you're trying to heighten suspense for your reader and you don't want them to know who did something. You want them to kind of be left in the dark just like uh, your protagonist. In that case, it's okay to use passive voice. So if you're using one of these three instances, I would argue that it's just fine to use passive voice. If you're not, it's probably a time to look at the sentence and see if you can fix the construction to make it easier for your reader. So to fix passive voice, it's pretty simple. All you need to do is find the subject of the sentence and fix it so it comes first. So in that sentence we had before, the present was opened by Jane. Now we say Jane opens the present moving her to the beginning of the sentence as the star where she belongs. So to fix it yourself, you simply find uh, the word by. It's not all the time, but a lot of times in passive voice constructions, the word by will indicate that you have used um, passive voice. You could also look for to be plus verb constructions like was opened. And when you found one or both of those, you can fix it so that the doer comes first. So instead of the present was opened by Jane, it becomes Jane opens the present. But that being said, as I mentioned, I'm going to show you how to do all of this with ProWriting Aid, which makes it much easier. So let's take a look at one of my sample texts here. So right now I am in the ProWriting Aid web editor. I am opening up a document and you will see that it is going to start to populate with suggestions. So over here on the left, I have the goals panel. The goals panel tells me where I fall, where my scores fall for this document within specific target ranges. Now, you'll remember way back to the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about different document types and how there's going to be kind of a sliding scale for what you want to have for a particular document type, depending on who your readers are. So the goals for ProWriting Aid makes it really simple for you to change those. You can come here to the drop down menu and select the specific type of content that you're writing. And when you select that specific type of content, you will get custom goals for whatever document type you're writing. So this, I believe, is a fantasy document. So I'm going to select fantasy. Um, and you'll see that I'll have slightly different goals that pop up. Um, we didn't scroll down before, but now because this is a fiction document instead of just a general one, there will be some, uh, some goals related to pacing, as well as emotion tells and dialogue tags, again, because this is fiction, right? Um, so I'll see some fiction related content here to make, uh, to because this document type is that. So I'm looking for passive voice. Um, we can see right now that I'm actually in the kind of target range. I'm here in the green. Uh, so I might decide that I, you know, don't necessarily need to fix any passive voice sentences. But if I want to, I can come into Pro Writing Aid over here on the right hand side and see examples of passive voice. So here we have a sentence fierce strokes across their horned helmets could be seen by the onlookers. So we have the word by, which indicates that this is a passive voice sentences. Um, and we can see that, you know, we have them at the at the very end of the sentence, so we don't see them, they don't pop into our brain <laughs> until the very end. Uh, now, Pro Writing Aid will highlight instances of passive voice in your writing. In some instances, like in this one, it might suggest uh, a way to rewrite that sentence. In other times, it might not, depending on how complicated the sentence is and how easy it would be to fix. Um, you can always either fix by clicking this, or you could just delete and rewrite the sentence yourself. Uh, if you ever see a suggestion like this, um, this, you know, passive voice, we've just gone over in depth, but if you ever see a suggestion and you're not sure what to do about it, this little orange eye up here on the right will pop up and show you an article about the, um, about the specific suggestion. It will give you some indications here about why you should change it if you decide to, um, as well as potentially a video or a click through to a full article. So this is some more information here to kind of help you decide, should I make this change or should I not? Remember, most of the suggestions, actually all of the suggestions I'll talk about in the webinar tonight, and a lot of the suggestions from ProWriting Aid are not always as black and white as this is wrong or this is right. 
sometimes you're going to see suggestions uh, that you might have to use some nuance um, and some understanding to decide if you're going to change or not exactly like passive voice. Uh, so having these articles is really helpful for you to be able to understand whether or not you should make that change and then either click it to make it just like that, or I can undo um, and decide to change it myself or just leave it. Okay, that was our first principle. Let's keep going to our second principle, which is to reduce glue words. So when you are writing, you should always prioritize working words over glue words. What does that mean? Working words are words that contain a sentence's most essential information. You cannot change them or the meaning of the sentence would change. So for instance, um, the sentences I used before, Haley climbs a mountain. If I changed Haley to Tom, the meaning of the sentence would change. If I changed mountain to escalator, <laughs> the meaning of the sentence would change. Uh, if I changed uh, Haley is in Scotland to Haley is in England, <laughs> The meaning of the sentence would change. Um, if I change Haley is in Scotland to Haley is in Ireland or Haley is in America or wherever, meanings of the sentence would change. If I change Haley to Carol, etc., all of that would change. Those are working words because they um, contain a sentence's most essential information. Um, so you'll notice that there were a lot of nouns in those examples. So switching out Haley for something else, switching out Scotland for something else. Um, if I changed Haley is in Scotland to Haley loves Scotland, the meaning of the sentence would change, even though both are true. Um, a verb is another example of a working word, something that you cannot change or the meaning of the sentence will change. So those are your working words. Those are the words that you need to prioritize in your sentence. Everything else in the sentence is a glue word. So glue words are necessary for sentences to make sense. However, we can often reduce, remove, or replace those glue words to make the sentence more clear. These tend to be words like prepositions, articles, words that you could kind of shift around um, to make the sentence uh, to make the sentence say the same thing in fewer words um, or more clearly. If you have too many of those glue words, the sentence will become sticky. A sticky sentence is hard for readers to understand and muddle through. Again, these words are always, um, are always required. However, too many of them is gonna make the sentence hard to read. So let's just look at an example of that. So this is a sticky sentence. Dave walked over into the backyard of the school in order to see if there was a new bicycle that he could use in his class. This sentence is very long. It has a lot of glue words in it. Before we get to fixing it, I would love for you to tell me in the chat, what are the working words in this sentence? Remember, working words are the words you cannot change without changing the meaning of the sentence. So go ahead and I'll give you a couple minutes to drop them in the chat. What are the working words, the words we cannot change without changing the meaning of the sentence? Dave, yep. Let's see. Dave, bicycle class. Dave walked backyard school, bicycle class. Yep. Dave, bicycle class. <laughs> Dave walked backyard school, bicycle class. Exactly. It looks like most of you have got the ones that I have got as well. So Dave walked, backyard, school, new bicycle, using class. If I changed bicycle to roller skates, the sentence would change. If I switched Dave to Haley, the sentence would change. If I switched school to hospital, the sentence would change. You get my point. These are the working words, the words that contain the sentence's most essential information. I've highlighted them here in yellow. That means that everything else, everything that is not highlighted is a glue word. It is a word that makes the sentence make sense, but as we can see, our proportion is way off. We have way more glue words than we have working words, which is partially why the sentence is such a mouthful. We don't need to have all of these glue words for the sentence to still make sense. In fact, we can reduce, we can remove, or we can replace them and the sentence is going to be more effective. How do we do that? 
Well, the good and bad news is that there is not one way to fix a sticky sentence. I say bad news because that means that there's not just one easy trick that I can give you. But I say good news because this is something that allows us to retain our voice as writers. So like I mentioned, oftentimes people are really nervous when I talk about editing tools or when I talk about clarity because they don't want their writing to sound like everyone else's. However, when fixing sticky sentences, because there's not just one way to do it, every, everybody's fix for it will, um, will sound a little bit different depending on what your intent is as a writer. So let's see that play out. I'm going to give you a couple minutes, and I would love for you to try to fix this sentence, making it more effective by removing, reducing, or replacing some of those blue words. Um, so you can go ahead and write your new sentence in the chat. I'll give you a couple minutes. Again, our goal is to keep as many of those working words as we can and reduce, remove, or replace some of those blue words. So I'll give you a few minutes to put that into the chat. We'll see how close you get to mine. <laughs> Okay, we've got Dave walked to the backyard of the school to find a bicycle for class. Nice. Dave walked into the school's backyard to find a new bicycle for class. Dave walked to the school's backyard to find a new bicycle to use in class. It was somebody split it up. Dave walked into the backyard of the school. He saw a new bicycle he could use in his class. Awesome. Yeah, so you see we had like four or five just completely different answers, all of which were similar, but correct, right? Dave walked into the school's backyard to see if there was a new bicycle to use in his class. Dave walked to the school's backyard to find a new bicycle to use in class. Awesome. Every single one of these versions is much better than the long, ineffective sentence here. However, we have eight or nine different ways to fix the sticky sentence, again, all of which are much better. So it's important to remember when fixing a sticky sentence, there's not just one way to do it. You can think about who you are as a writer, what voice you want to use, and really just remember that our goal is to reduce those glue words. You don't have to get rid of them all together, but to make sure our percentage of glue words to working words is much more in line. So here is my version. Dave checked the school's backyard for a new bicycle to use in class. I got a little cheeky. I changed the verb. It doesn't truly matter at the end. The goal, again, is what your job is as a writer, uh, excuse me, what your intent is as a writer to make sure that you're true to that. So when you're looking at sticky sentences, we're not looking for one perfect almighty sentence. What we are looking for is something that is true to your intent as a writer. So if you were to do this alone, um, I would recommend looking for overly long sentences. Those tend to be sticky. It'll vary a bit by genre, but typically anything over 18 words long is probably too long for most genres. You'll want to look for glue words. So words like prepositions, conjunctions, articles, all of those are good indications that your sentence has too many sticky words. Um, and then you're just going to re rewrite reducing the glue words in it. Again, there's not one way to fix a sentence like this. It's up to you, your intent as a writer, and what the sentence um, what the sentence looks like. Now, of course, you can fix this for writing aid, however. Um, so first, you will see on the left-hand side over here that for most of your document types, you'll see your glue index. So your glue index gives you your overall percentage of glue words to sticky words through your whole document. So for most genres, we recommend staying at about 40% glue words, 60% working words. So you can see here that I'm a little outside of that um, recommended margin with 44% glue words. But again, if you're near-ish to 40%, you can kind of think through, am I in a good percentage place or do I wanna spend some time fixing this? If you do decide that you wanna spend some time fixing this, you can simply click glue index like I did right there, or you could come up here on the top and click sticky sentences Either way, it's going to take you to the sticky sentences check. What you'll find in this report are three things. First, you will find how many sticky sentences there are in your document. Sticky is anything that is 60% glue words or higher. If the sentence is sticky, I would recommend fixing it. However, if it's in the semi-sticky category, which is somewhere between 40 to 60% glue words, you can lose a use a little bit of your judgment and decide, you know, am I close enough? Is that fine? Or do I really want to fix it? 
I would typically recommend fixing almost every sticky sentence. Semi-sticky sentence is up to you. And again, your intent as a writer and what your overall document is looking like. Um, within the sticky sentences report, you can see the specific sentences that are highlighted as sticky. And then if you hover over the sentence, you'll also be able to see what the glue words are. So you know what words to reduce, remove, or replace to fix the sentence. Um, now, like we talked about with passive voice, sometimes um, in providing aid, there are suggestions of what you should do. Sometimes there are not. There are not sticky sentence suggestions because like we talked about, there's not one way to fix a sticky sentence. So while the suggestion will tell you what the sticky sentences are, as well as what the glue words are in here, fixing the sentence is going to be up to you as the writer. Um, again, you'll identify the glue words so you know what you can reduce, remove, or replace, but the goal is not to create one specific sentence, it's to create a better sentence removing those glue words. That is one of my favorite reports because glue words is one of my biggest, <laughs> uh, my biggest uh, challenges, my biggest bad habits. Okay, let's move on to principle number three, which is use powerful verbs. Uh, so we just focused on subjects at the beginning of this presentation. Now it's time to talk about verbs. So verbs are the engines of our writing. They are our action words that power our sentences forward. Unfortunately, many writers in all genres use weak verbs. They tend to do two things. First, they tend to hide their verbs through a process known as nominalization. What I have highlighted here in yellow is a nominalization. A nominalization is when you take a powerful verb and you turn it into a noun phrase. So in this three word phrase, make an announcement. The real powerful verb here is actually a noun. However, we've kind of hidden that verb, taken away some of its power by saying make an announcement instead. Make an announcement is a little bit weaker. It uses a much weaker verb. It's also longer and, um, and less to the point. So it makes the sentence a little bit less effective, a little bit less to the point. Writers also tend to use adverbs to uh, modify weak verbs. This happens a lot in fiction writing. So it's uh, an instance where instead of just saying exactly what you mean, you rely on a weak verb plus an adverb to modify it to make the sentence more effective. So saying I ran quickly towards the bus instead of saying something like I dashed towards the bus. Adverbs are often, um, they're kind of a polarizing thing in writing, but often people see adverbs as a little bit lazy. And again, taking power away from the verbs, which would really be the engines of the writing. As a writer, your goal is to let your verbs power your writing, again, regardless of genre. You should be focusing on verbs that give the clearest indication of what you're trying to say and what the action in the sentence is. So to do this, you need to do two things. First, you need to remove nominalizations. So again, instead of we will make an announcement of the winner on Friday, we will announce the winner on Friday. Shorter, clearer, more to the point. Similarly, using strong verbs that say what you mean. So instead of I ran quickly, I dashed towards the bus. It's a much more evocative phrase um, and much more shorter, uh, much shorter, much more to the point um, than if you're having to use a verb plus an adverb construction. Uh, now, Pro Writing Aid can help you with this as well. Let me see if I can find any in here. Go back to my real time reports. Let's see. So began to leap, here's an example of a nominalization. It can just be fixed into leaped. We don't need to say began to leap. We could just make that really clear by going into the verb. Um, we have an adverb here that we could uh, fix um, at that point. That was an adjective suggestion. But either way, pro writing, it can help you find both, again, um, hidden verbs. It can help you find nominalizations and it can just help you make your writing more clear. So here are places where you have hidden verbs. Again, we have some readability improvements to make um, the sentence more effective. And again, to reduce some of those, uh, reduce some of those instances where we've used verbs that are less powerful than what we actually mean. Okay. Our fourth principle is to target correct readability. So audiences of all kinds, whether you're writing fiction, academic, et cetera, typically prefer works that are easier to read. Um, what does that mean? It means that in your writing, your ideas should be the stars. Readable work is work that lets ideas shine so audiences don't have to worry about word choice or sentence construction. Your goal is to prioritize ideas by making your sentences the vehicles for those ideas. You do not need to hide those ideas behind complicated structures or word choice. 
Now, when you're making something readable, it also means that you choose your words carefully. Now, you do not need to forego all interesting or domain specific words in your writing. You just have to be careful about which ones you're choosing. So for instance, if you are writing um, an academic paper, you will probably want to use domain specific vocabulary that's related to your field. You don't need to make your verbs or your, you know, your nouns or something like that very difficult. You'll want to use vocabulary that's related to your field and kind of spend your interesting words on those, that domain specific language, rather than on you know using passive voice or making your sentence more, um, more confusing. I always like to talk about this when I was a teacher, I would write exams um, for students. And when you're writing exams for students, you have to be very careful about readability levels because students are still learning. So sometimes when I would write science exams, I would have to use really complicated terms like photosynthesis or something like that. Um, that would mean that kind of all of my readability juice was spent on the word photosynthesis. So everything around it had to be very simple to even out uh, that readability. So that's what I'm talking about when I mean choosing words carefully. Doesn't mean that no matter what genre you're writing, you need to get rid of all interesting words. Just be choosy about the ones that you do, do choose to use. If you're writing a, uh, a business paper or something for work and you're using a lot of jargon, maybe decide, you know, will my audience understand this jargon or should I, you know, focus on interesting words in some other way, right? You don't have to get rid of all of them. Just make sure that you're using the ones there consciously and that there's something that your audience can understand. That leads me to my final point, which is that when you're considering readability, you need to make sure you're taking your audience into account. This is especially important for those of us who write in multiple genres, right? So I write fiction uh, personally. I also write for work all the time. And then I'm also in uh, grad school. So <laughs> I write for grad school, right? In each of those contexts, my audience is different. So I am targeting different readability in each of those contexts. Fiction writing is going to be, when I'm writing, working on a romance novel, the readability that I'm targeting is going to be very different than a grad school paper because the audience is different, the understanding is different. So readability is going to be different for almost every single document you write, particularly if you're writing in different contexts. So it's not just a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, readability does not mean that your prose is boring or that your writing is dumbed down. Just like I said, you can use unique words just the same way I used photosynthesis. Just need to make sure that everything around it is done um, uh, is simple enough to make that high, to make that uh, readability work for that particular audience, right? It also meet, does not mean that your ideas are dumbed down. Again, sometimes people worry that if they're targeting like a seventh grade readability or something like that, which is about eleven to twelve years old in the states, that that means that their writing is for eleven year, or twelve year olds. Could not be further from the truth. You know, if you're writing something very adult, you can still write it in seventh grade language. Doesn't mean that seventh graders are going to read it or that it's appropriate for them, just means that the language could be understood by them if they did read it. So there's a, uh, a nuance there between what an actual readability level is and what that means for who your readers are. Uh, so how do you understand whether or not you're targeting the correct readability? A readability score is something that predicts who will be able to read your writing. There are many different readability scores to choose from. Uh, Flesh, the Flesh formula is a, um, Flesh Kincaid is a common one. Dale Shaw is another common one. They all kind of present the same data in different ways, which is basically a report about who could read your writing um, based on its word choice, sentence structure, etc. There are many, many types of readability scores to choose from. Again, it doesn't quite matter as much which one you're choosing as much as you being able to understand what it says. So if you decide to run your work through a readability calculator of some kind and your score is too high, there are four things that you can do to fix it. First is to use an easier vocabulary. Vocabulary words are one of the top things that make work harder to read. So if you are using a lot of complicated terms, cut some of those out of there and your readability will go back down. Longer sentences also tend to make readability higher. So if your readability is too high, you could remove some of those glue words to make the sentence shorter. You can do what someone did in the chat and chop your sentences in two. Um, shortening sentences by dividing them at conjunctions is a good way to make them uh, more readable. You can also redo, uh, remove jargon. Jargon and domain-specific vocabulary are often something that makes the writing more complicated. And then also passive voice constructions, which make the sentence longer, tend to make them more complicated as well. Um, now, to fix this with Pro Writing Aid, we've done a couple things. First, 
I think most importantly, is having a readability target for your specific audience and your specific document type. Like I mentioned, this is going to shift for every different document type. So I have fantasy here, and you'll see that I'm at the very high end, uh, which is seventh grade, which again is about 11 to 12 year olds. That's because most adults who read mass market fiction like to read it at about a seventh grade level. So this is kind of the highest um, range it will go. If I shifted this to business or academic, the, um, the band is going to shift a little bit because those types of writers or those types of readers have a different, uh, a different range for readability. So academic, for instance, are much more used to reading something more complicated in that particular context because of how uh, written documents are structured. Somebody who is an academic might still read a romance novel at a seventh grade reading level because the context is different, right? So again, just saying that you're writing at seventh grade doesn't mean that you or your readers are reading at an 11 year old's level. It just means that for that particular document type, that's what people like to engage with. It makes sense if you think about it for like romance novels or fantasy, people don't wanna be sitting there with a dictionary. They want to be immersed in your world or in the relationships you're depicting, right? So they don't need to be sitting there with a dictionary to understand what you're trying to say. Whereas again, in an academic context, in the business context, et cetera, um, it's typically more complicated writing because uh, because of how it's structured and what, the, what you're trying to get across. So, uh, Pro Writing Aid will tell you your overall document readability grade. It will also break it down by the uh, particular particular paragraphs that are difficult or easy to read. This one is good to go <laughs> because we're in that green uh, that green barrier. But if you had any that were underlined in yellow or red, it will show you which are sort of hard to read and which are definitely hard to read, uh, very difficult to read, which are ones that you can fix. Now, Pro Writing Aid will also show you um, specific readability improvements, even if you're in that right readability zone. So we've got, let's see, here's a good one. So in the direction of is typically a longer and more wordy phrase than just toward or two, right? So Amra looked toward where his foe had once stood. Easier, shorter, more to the point. So there's a multiple ways that you can address readability and pro writing aid. It's not just about grade level. You can also come in here and find readability um, readability suggestions just in the goals report or the style report as well. Okay, and then on to our final principle before we have some time for questions. So we've talked about cutting, 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 making things more simple, but now let's talk about choosing specific words. So if you do not use specific words and use vague words instead, your writing is going to lack the specificity that readers need to understand what you're trying to say. So in this sentence, Kate made some improvements to her cabin and now it's worth more. It's pretty vague. So tell me in the chat, what do you think, what do you picture when you hear Kate made some uh, improvements? What do you picture someone doing to their house? DIY, renovations. DIY. Well, what kind of DIY? What are they? What are they doing in that DIY? Painting. DIY for me means like uh, cleaning, <laughs> smaller repairs. Yeah. Mm -mm. So, you know, painting, smaller repairs, renovations. It's a pretty big range right away. Brought a uh, a green green plant for the corner of the room. Exactly right. That's kind of my DIY. Um, and yes. Exactly. This is a vague word, right? Improvements is a vague word. I'm asking you to give me more information and you can't because this is a really vague sentence, right? Same thing with DIY. We don't know what that means. It, there's vastly different contexts depending on who we are and what our understanding of improvements is. So this sentence is not going to create an effective picture for our readers because everybody who puts something in the chat has a different idea of what it's going to be. Here's a much more specific exa example. Kate replaced the bathroom suite, repainted the living room, and laid hardwood floors in her cabin, increasing its value by 10%. Now you can exactly picture what Kate did, right? Even if you can't picture exactly what her living room looks like, you can picture someone going into the bathroom, replacing that. You can picture carpet going away and hardwood floors coming in. You have a much clearer idea. And so if I were to ask again, what did Kate do? You could tell me what she did in much more specificity than the previous example, which was very vague. Now, something I want you to note about that is that our second sentence, if we go back and look at them, so we got a short sentence here and a much longer 
a more specific sentence here. So it's important to remember as we're looking at our writing that clarity does not always equal brevity. Clarity is not always about being as short, short, short as you can be. It's also about being specific. You need to always be weighing how short should my writing be with how specific it should it, it should be to make sure you're as clear as possible. It's not just one or the other. It has to be both in order to make your um, make your sentence the most effective. Now, a good test for this is to look back and see if you have the right types of words, working words or glue words, right? I have very, very few glue words in the sentence. I could not change bathroom for kitchen. I could not change living room for uh, bathroom. I could not change hardwood to carpet, right? These would change the meaning of the sentence. So it's important to make sure that, you know, if you are doing the work on your sentence, you need to think through, uh, you need to think through what the changes are and what you're actually trying to say. And if you have more working words than glue words, it's going to uh, typically mean that you are being more clear and that you're not just stuffing your sentence unnecessarily. So a good way to fix this is to ask yourself, is the movie a reader playing in their head accurate to what I'm trying to show? John in the chat is asking, did Kate really do it or did she bring in tradespeople? In my mind, Kate did it for herself. <laughs> um, but, you know, maybe in John's mind, uh, Kate had some tradespeople come in or she had someone bring in the cabinets herself or whatever. All of those are perfectly valid explanations. Just need to make sure the sentence has that covered, right? So in my sentence, I intend that Kate did it all, but in a different one, she might not have. Again, the goal is to make sure the movie your reader is playing in their head is accurate. So in my mind, I have I picture Kate going and like ripping off the cabinets in her kitchen. If in your mind you picture Kate placing a call to handymen and then having them come and do it, you could say Kate hired handymen to make some improvements to her uh, or to make to replace her bathroom suite, whatever it was. Um, Again, the goal is to make sure that the movie your reader is playing in their head is accurate to what you're trying to show, particularly if it matters a lot. Now, um, within Pro Writing Aid, you can do a number of things to fix this. Uh, so first, the overall report over here will help highlight some places that are not or that are too vague. You can also in the diction report, I'll show you, come and find vague and abstract words. So the vague and abstract words check will help you find places where you have used words that tend to be meaningless because they're either used too often, they're too abstract, or again, they'll just make the writing less, um, less vivid. All right, so today we talked about why clarity is the most important goal for all readers. We talked about five key principles to make your writing more clear. And then we talked about how to use those principles to make your writing more effective by using Pro Writing Aid. Um, now, I have about 15 more minutes left, so if anyone has any questions either about what we've talked about today or specifically about the Pro Writing Aid tool, I am more than happy to answer them with the time I have left. Uh, and you can either put them into the Q&A or into the chat, either way. Okay, so we have, does pro writing aid um, suggest strong verbs to replace weak verb plus adverbs? Yes, it does. Um, so let's see, let's see if I can find an example. So this is a vague word. Um, let's see though, if I can find one in this text. I might not have an adverb, uh, one of those in here, but yes, it does. <laughs> um, it does suggest that, uh, especially if I said, um, I wonder if I can put one in here. If I put like walked slowly, it would likely suggest uh, a change for that. So yes, it does. Uh, and thank you so much for those who said this is awesome. I appreciate you coming. Um, okay, uh, someone asked, what is the difficulty transferring manuscript from pages to pro writing aid to Word? Um, so when you're transferring, so first of all, you can upload any documents in pro writing aid by clicking upload here. When you click upload, um, it will upload in the format that you had. Now, the challenge of going from pages to pro writing aid to Word is that your document format is going to change. Um, so you would go from like a pages document to pro writing aid to Word. 
I would recommend maybe putting it in Word in the first place, just so you're not doing that file format change, because anytime you're changing formats, even if you were just going to pages to Word, sometimes formatting can get a little messed up. So if I were you and you already have Microsoft Word, I would just write in there because we do have a Word add-in that brings the Pro Writing Aid tool right into Word. So that way you don't have to change anything at all. Um, so it's not it's not that you can't do it. It just means that anytime you're changing anything, again, even if it was just pages to Word, there's more of a chance that something is going to um, something is going to like mess up in the formatting as you go through. Uh, so if I were you, I would either do it just right in Word in the first place um, or upload into upload a pages document, export back as a pages document, um, and then export into Word from there, uh, just because it's going to be just more challenging and <laughs> more in danger of formatting getting lost um, if you keep moving. Uh, okay, somebody asked how to use for screenplays. So we have a script function here. Uh, for general script. Uh, so that will give you feedback on a script. Um, obviously, this is not a script. Uh, so it's going to be kind of off <laughs> in terms of what I'm looking for. Uh, but we do have script formatting here. And then we work with final draft. Um, so I know a lot of screenplay writers work in final draft. Um, so we read final draft files, which is really convenient. Uh, so that way you don't have to change anything. Anyone else? Any other questions I can answer? Awesome. All right. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Oh, dialogue writing. Okay. So um, within fiction, uh, you will see specific dialogue tags here. So it will highlight first if you've used unusual dialogue tags. So anything besides said and asked, you should usually try to avoid. Um, so it will uh, tell you if you've used unusual ones. It will also tell you if you've used too many dialogue tags, you're typically supposed to just use them when someone's the speaker is changing. Uh, so it'll tell you if you've used too many. It'll also tell you places where you've used dialogue tags with adverbs, so like shouted loudly or something like that, where it's kind of redundant and don't need it, um, which is a good uh, check. Oh, somebody was looking for adverbs. Um, you can find here the adverbs um, at the bottom there. Um, okay, uh, but yes, it'll help you a lot with the dialogue. Um, and then there is a dialogue report over here on the right. Um, so I can either find them in the real time checker or over here, which again gives you the same information about how many dialogue tags you have, if you have any unusual ones, so anything other than said or asked, if you use them with bad adverbs, etc. Uh, I use it, I use too many dialogue tags and they use a lot of bad, <laughs> bad dialogue tags too. So it's really helpful for me. Uh, okay, so someone says when importing my document, all italics seem to have disappeared. Um, so when importing, either you can like hover like I just did and add italics back if you're writing in this. However, if you've imported it and they've disappeared, if you just go up here and then hit export, they should come back. Um, so sometimes formatting, like when it appears in the web editor, is not going to show up there. But if you if you make sure that you export back, you do not copy and paste then it'll save it. Um, copying, pasting, no matter whether you're doing it in Gmail, wherever, like any program, uh, try to avoid copying and pasting because it adds like sneaky, sneaky characters. So as long as you upload and then export, your formatting should be retained, even if you can't see it in here. Um, and then if it doesn't, just send an email to hello at ProWritingAid and they'll sort you. Um, okay. John says, is it per license or per computer? It's per user. Um, so you, I have multiple computers. It's installed on multiple of mine. Um, so you can totally have it on more than one computer. Uh, someone asked, is there an amount of dialogue that is too much? Um, so it'll really depend on the scene um, and depend on what you're trying to convey. Um, you know, if you're doing a, a scene that's more backstory, you're going to have less dialogue or more setting than if you're doing something that is... A conversation <laughs> that will obviously have more dialogue. Uh, so it'll really, really kind of depend on what you're writing, um, 
what the goal of the scene is and that type of thing. For me, it's less important to think about how much of that overall dialogue or the overall document is dialogue and more about what the quality of that dialogue is. Like, am I using effective dialogue tags? Um, this is a whole other topic, but am I using the dialogue to move the scene forward? Um, again, it's not necessarily about like specifically how much dialogue it's in, is in there because that can vary from scene to scene, uh, but is that dialogue serving a purpose in moving the story forward? Uh, can you use it on tablets? You can. I use it on my iPad. Um, however, it's mainly meant to be used on web editors. So I would say you can use it on an iPad. Um, phones are a no-go, but if you have an iPad or something like that, you could use it. Uh, but I think it's much better on a computer if you can. And like John asked, it's a per license, it's like a per user thing. So you can have it on multiple devices. So if you try on your tablet and also on your computer, which is what I do, that's totally fine. Any other questions? How often do I run webinars like this? Um, I run webinars like this. Well, right now I'm doing them every day <laughs> um, for, uh, for NaNoWriMo. There's a bunch of different ways you can engage with our webinars. So we have, um, if you go up here and you go to learn and then webinars, you'll see all of the upcoming webinars that are free to join. Um, so this is the one that's happening right now. There's another one tomorrow. Um, there's another, there's two tomorrow. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different webinars. We typically do three to four per week. We also have Pro Writing Aid Academy, which we're going to uh, be talking more about in the new year, um, which is a course platform uh, within Pro Writing Aid that does specific like fiction and other types of writing uh, webinars. So we're doing, I'm doing a daily uh, write-in for that right now where we're working on our novels um, and we're coming together for writing sprints every day. Uh, so that, if that's something you're interested in, definitely keep an eye on our email list because we'll talk about them more. But there's a lot of free stuff um, if you're not involved in that right now that you can enjoy. Oh, good. I'm so glad. <laughs> so glad you came from Romance Writers Week. Good to see you again. That was really fun. If you didn't go to Romance Writers Week um, or you would like to, we have Fantasy Writers Week coming up in February. The weeks are so much fun. Um, I feel like I'm just now recovering from romance, even like two and a half months or two months later, because it was so much fun and we just learned so much. I'm so glad to see you again too. Okay, well, uh, this is weird for me. I typically do these in the day in the States, so it's nighttime in Scotland. <laughs> so I hope everybody has a really great night. Um, I will, if you have any questions, please feel free to email hello at prowritingaid.com and ask for Haley. I'm more than happy to help. Um, and then, if you're interested in upgrading to Pro Writing Aid, we're doing our Black Friday sale right now. It is the best sale of the year. Um, if you're if you have the the funds, I would highly recommend snagging a lifetime license while you can. Um, they are on such good sale, and it's truly such a good deal. It covers every integration, um, every update forever. So if you have the funds, I would highly suggest getting a lifetime license if you can. Um, and if not, you know, yearly, monthly are great too. But this is like. A, a, as John says, a steal, a steal for a lifetime. Um, so everybody have a great night. I will talk to you soon. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to email hello at prowritingaid.com and ask for Haley. Philly, hello. I used to live in South Philly. <laughs> so <laughs> glad to see someone from Philly here. Um, all right. Bye, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.